I'm happy to show you what this house finally looks like. This is the thermary siding that has finally been put on the house. We've got all of the exterior insulation and the rain screen and all the amazing performance details that we put on underneath. And because you know that everything on this channel and on the Home Diagnosis TV series is about the science of homes, you know we wouldn't have picked a siding that wasn't interesting scientifically. So what I'm going to show you right now is the thermary Ignite, Drift, and Kodiak decking. What we have is wood, solid wood. All the wood that's being installed on the siding and on the decking here is kiln-dried Norwegian spruce. It comes in already kiln-dried, then they shape it once and stack it on what's basically a railroad car that then gets driven into a kiln. But this kiln is kind of special, so they cook it at 419 degrees Fahrenheit until the wood contains zero moisture, literally zero percent. Then they introduce moisture back into it with steam under pressure so that they can get the wood back to four percent. Because if you try to shape wood that's completely dry, it's going to break. It's, it's not really the way that wood is supposed to be. It's going to get its humidity back somehow. So they introduce it back in a controlled environment. Then they shape it again and they end up with what is essentially defect-free batches of cladding, siding, decking, whatever it is that you're, you're looking for. So it's 100% usable. You're not going to call any bent pieces of wood out of this. What that cooking it at 419 degrees does is take the cellulose out. The cellulose part of the wood is the food source for bugs and fungus. So what it does with that cellulose is it basically transforms it, as far as I understand, into lignin. That's the other main part. The lignin is like basically rebar. So it's what is providing a lot of structural strength for this wood and um, it's not going to be edible. So the lignin both gets strengthened, what's already in the wood, and you destroy the walls and you turn what were cellular formations into long rebar-like formations. That adds obviously to the structural stability. It also increases the moisture resistance. So if you were to get the wood wet, it hangs on to moisture a lot less well because it doesn't have the cellulose anymore. And so I shouldn't have to do anything to this for 30, 50 years if I can get away with it. We've done so much behind the scenes with the exterior insulation, with the exterior rain screen, with the bug screening details, that I think that this is going to last even longer than the manufacturer expects it to when a normal person installs it. I'll show you the Kodiak decking, which is a lot like a cedar deck would be. Uh, and we've got the siding that's the gray is called Platinum Drift. Uh, the black is called Ignite, and it's made to look like Shoshugi-ban, uh, which is a Japanese charring style. Now, all three of these have hidden fastener systems. That is really important, not just for looks, which is why a lot of architects or designers are going to uh, sell it to you. It's like, ooh, it, it looks so seamless. That's very nice. I don't care as much as I care about the performance details. The roof that we put on this house we went the extra mile and went with a hidden fastener system on that, which is called standing seam metal roof. The hidden fastener means that you're not going to have the sun or the weather, meaning the rain and snow and stuff like that, hitting that fastener. And in the case of a roof, you've got a gasket that's there that's forming some of the waterproofing details of that screw. And that is going to rot in the sun 100%. So you're going to have to go up on the roof and you're going to have to replace them piecemeal, or you have to replace the whole thing at once. All the screws will need to be replaced. That is, sounds like a major drag. Also, because I care about holes a lot, I don't want two holes where one will do. So the hidden fastener on the roof helps with that. On the walls and on the decking, we're able to get any of those little penetrations where you might have a screw that's driven a little further than it needs to be, which you cannot avoid. Even if you do it yourself, you're going to do that. That means that water will puddle if it's in the case of a deck. Or water might be able to sit in there and get into the wood because, of course, this stuff is sealed on the edges. And when I cut this siding, I'm going to want to seal this with a wax that Thermary has actually tells you exactly which wax to buy if you're going to do it the right way. So we're going to seal all these with this wax to make sure that water doesn't get in at the cut ends of this. The surface is already sealed. So you should have a really well waterproofed assembly. Also, what's nice here is that these all have tongue and groove profile. So you can see that there's a tongue on the top and a groove on the bottom. The tongue fits into the groove. That helps with shedding water and drainage in the right direction. You can see that the, the uh, one side of the tongue is lower than the other. 
And also on the ends, you've got this gem or joint end molding, which means that the, they will lock into each other, which is very helpful because now I don't have to meet up the joints in the siding on top of a furring strip. So I don't have to be able to screw both of them. If I meet this up in the middle of space, because they're gonna lock together, it fixes that problem. So that also helps with the waste. You should have almost no waste with this stuff. You end up with little tiny pieces like this or pieces that get damaged. Here, you can see on this drift that the wood got damaged and it's not the same gray color as the stain. Clearly, this is stained on the front. What's beautiful about this, they call it drift for a couple of reasons. Number one, it looks like driftwood, it looks like reclaimed lumber. And you know, if you watch our channel, both the Tiny Lab, which is the world's highest performance tiny house on wheels where we live right now, and this house have no reclaimed materials in it at all. Some people out there are screaming right now because reclaimed materials are the future and that's how we save the planet. Well, you have no idea where those reclaimed materials have been. You don't know what chemicals were soaked into them. Uh, you don't know what kind of paints were on them. It's kind of risky when you're talking about chemistry of homes to bring something like this onto or inside of your home. So we're not really into reclaimed. Also hard to control consistency. What's cool about this though also aside from looking like driftwood at first is that the color of the wood itself will drift. Because this is cooked, uh, it's going to age uh, pretty quickly. So this color right here that you see that's the natural wood, this will age and turn to the same color as this within about six to eight months in full sun. We picked the platinum color, by the way, because it is the one color, there's like six different uh, drift colors that Thermary offers. This is the one that will look almost exactly the same in 30 years as it does when you receive it off the truck. So this color that they've matched for the stain is what the grade wood will look like ultimately when it's weathered. All this stuff will want to turn this color eventually, and that includes the deck. So if you're okay with that, then great. And we certainly are. I, I like the gray color. And if you need to touch up stuff like this, they've got little paint kits, but of course this is just a cast off piece and we didn't have to worry about it. You'll, I'll show you around the house and you'll be able to see how beautiful everything looks. One other thing that sold us on this uh, product line from Thermary is that it requires no finishing. We spent a lot of time finishing the cedar boards that went onto the tiny lab because that was gonna be exposed to weather and I wanted it to last for a long time. This stuff, because it's been cooked and because it's got the, the uh, drainage profiles that it's got, is gonna last a really long time and I don't have to paint this ever. I don't have to seal it with polyurethane. I don't have to uh, wax it except for the cut ends. So this makes my life a lot easier on maintenance and that is definitely something about high performance. If you're talking about tuning the house, tune the occupants to the house and make it so that the house doesn't require a lot of maintenance. I've seen lots and lots of beautiful things on houses that I know for a fact take a lot of time for the homeowner to maintain and to keep looking nice. This is not one of them. The crew that we had this uh, put on by took two weeks solid to do the whole thing. Partly because I was, I asked them for some specific stuff and also I'm not a professional home builder so I probably didn't make it much easier for them by doing some of the weird little corner details that I did. <laughs> Let's get up close and look at some of the details here. Drift Platinum, Ignite Dragon Skin. Let me talk about the Drift Platinum for a second first. All this stuff covers up the beautiful rain screen that we had and going up the wall, I was worried that they would have to kind of really finesse those fasteners that we had countersunk, but some of them weren't as countersunk as others because we were moving as fast as we could, uh, but they didn't have to touch it at all. And I cannot see a single variation in these walls, which I'm very happy about. Now, the first thing that they did was mark where the first course was gonna be around the entire house. And that's something that I had not, I'm not a siding professional, so I don't know these things. Hadn't thought like, oh, that's a good idea to make sure that all the lines meet up. So if you're standing looking at an outside corner, you see that they, they meet up at exactly the same place. But on this wall right here, you can see that this is actually a different size than this. This is called a one by eight, even though it's just shy of seven inches. These are European products, so they don't build them in inches. Anyway, this one is smaller. This is more like a six inch, which is more like a five inch. So the lines here didn't have to meet up. So this is the one place where we could, if there was any adjustment that needed to be made, we could do it on this wall. You can see that this is perfectly flat. It's not lapped siding. And I'm happy about that because we are having to do things like trim windows. And the trim on the windows is a lot easier if you have a flat surface that you're fastening to. What you see is what you get. We put it up, that's it, it's done. I love it. This stuff is, bears some explaining. 
So it looks like what's called shoshugi ban wood from Japan. It's this technique of charring wood with fire to cook out some of the stuff on the surface is what they're doing. The rest of the wood behind that surface layer of char is still wood. It's not cooked like this thermary is. This is actually not charred at all. One of the byproducts of the charred wood is that if you were to do this with it, your hand comes off black. This is actually not charred. This is cooked, and then they paint it, and in the case of the dragon skin pattern, they've impressed it by just pushing uh, a pattern into it. I have mixed feelings about something that looks like something that it's not, but in this case, this tells a story about the charring of wood and why you would want to char wood for reasons of insect uh, repellents, for reasons of durability, that actually this is better than the shoshugi. Now, the inside corners, I instructed the siding crew I do not want to trim this. Like I said in other videos, trimming this house forever could end up being a 10, 20 year process. There's always something else to trim. Like, ooh, I can make that look a little bit more seamless. I don't care about that stuff. I want this house to work, to be a beautiful place for us to raise our daughters and to live and be happy. Play music, dance, stuff like that. So inside corners can be cut so that they're perfect. I told them that that's what I wanted. And in some cases I had to come along and be like, hey, can we make that a little tighter? Like, that's a little, a little loose. So you want to maintain that eighth inch gap. I also am going to show you something that has to do with the roof, the eave to wall connection, which I also did not want to trim. And that worked out perfectly. And I'll show you that. Uh, that was iffy. But the outside corners, of course, we're going to have to trim because you're going to have a cut edge on one of them. And it's just hard to make that look perfect. Even if I had them do a beveled corner, if we left that gap that's the proper amount of gap, then it's possible that bugs might get in there. And ugh. Anyway, it was just like, I didn't want to mess around with that. Now, in general, I had to remind the crew to wax the ends and to remember to drill before you screw in, in the last eight inches before an end hits. Um, but the, they did generally a very good job. And here, uh, there was a detail that I was kind of having nightmares about uh, before we did it. And I finally just said, you know what? I'm gonna let them figure out whatever it is. And I just stayed away. They came up with a great, plan. So what we did, we had the rain screen running from the bottom to the top of this wall with a bug vent, the core vent at the bottom and the top. Then we had them install that cement board soffit paneling that you see back there, uh, pre-painted, and nail that up. Then we had them come along and put the siding up so that it butts into the bottom of that. So this detail right here was kind of difficult because we've got this tongue that, remember, you need to sit it into. And the problem is that in order to get the groove up over the tongue, you need a quarter inch of upward space. So that would mean that there's gonna be a quarter inch gap at the top of this entire wall. You will see that there is not a gap there. And that's because they didn't use this. They went like this and they carved off the back of it. So all they had to do, they didn't have to sit it up on top of the tongue. They just put it up there. And now it's sitting over the tongue but it didn't have to go up and over. So they were able to get it completely flush along the entirety of these walls, which I was very pleased about because that, that was kind of an unexpected creative fix from them. Now you'll see on the house, some of the soffit paneling is vented. It's got holes in it. They came that way, I did not drill those holes. And some of it is not vented. That was a very purposeful decision. Where it's vented, you have a choice. I could have gotten this in a 24 inch width that had vents along one side of it. I did not do that. I got two 12 inch widths and I had them install them like this so that there's holes along the house and holes along the outside. The reason for that is, again, I just described the siding goes all the way up and butts right into it. So the rain screen that is a ventilation gap behind that is meant for air to be flowing up through the, the backside of the cladding. And if there's not a vent at the top of that, then there's no way for the air to get out, number one. Number two, if the air is gonna go out from here and then go up into the eave, might as well use that stack effect to flush out the eaves. So that's why I then added another row of vents at the front of the eave so the air goes up and in and then is pushed down out of the front. Just a beautiful way to use some pressure that's naturally gonna be occurring because of the sun shining down on the walls. That's just a nice thing to have. Second thing is that where we don't have vents, 
That's because there is no rain screen, number one. And number two, there is no way for moisture to get in there. The reason that you would have vented eaves, and remember that these eaves are not attached to my house at all. Every eave that's on this house is bolted on. So it's just a little triangle that happens to be tacked onto the house. So all I'm talking about is ventilating inside there, only because there's a rain screen. Where you have a giant roof overhang on the front and the back of the house, I opted not to do venting at all because, again, ventilation for eaves or for roofs is for getting rid of moisture. And since we have a really intense, very nice roof, that thing is not going to leak. So there's no water that's going to be getting down into the roof overhangs from there. And there's no way for water to get up through it, except for diffusion, which some people say, oh, worry about that. You don't have to worry about that too much. If you stop most of the air leakage, then you've taken care of it. Also, the sun here in Atlanta is going to dry out a lot of stuff as long as you don't have intense shade from building your house in a forest, which we have not done. And last, we have the Kodiak decking. Your choice in a lot of cases is gonna be some kind of a plasticky PVC thing, which chemically, not that interested in. When sun shines down on plastic, it's gonna change the composition of it. You got babies crawling around on the ground down there, which my daughter, even though she's four, still spends a lot of time on the ground. Um, I don't want her breathing that stuff. Composites have some plastic and some wood in them. Again, not too interested in that, and also, they, moisture-wise, they get a little bit weird. Just like the Drift, the Kodiak has a rough side and a smooth side. On the Drift cladding, you're gonna wanna put the rough side out because it's more beautiful. And that's the whole point, uh, is to put the smooth side not shown. In the case of the decking, of course, you do not want the rough side up because that's gonna give your feet splinters. You put the smooth side up and it's nice and sanded. Um, so this is gonna go in just as easy as any other grooved hidden fastener system. So you've got these grooves that are uh, cut into both sides and you put a clip in and the screw goes through the clip. You end up with the proper amount of space between these so that we've got water that could be dripping down through here. God forbid my daughter drops a drink. We will have the underside of this soften it in as well. Now you can see here we don't have those gem joints where we're going to be meeting them up in open space because probably that would be dangerous. So structurally you're going to meet all these up on the joists that are running through this thing. These are 16 inches on center. We're going to build the main deck 12 inches on center. Uh, but in this case this is not a very used balcony. This is for my two daughters and we've got a, a guest room that also has a balcony. All of that stuff is going to receive the same Kodiak decking and this like I mentioned, it is going to turn, if the sun hits it, the same gray as the drift platinum on the walls. So aesthetics-wise, I'm delighted that Grace also is very happy about this. We obviously had to pick all the stuff that you see together. She was less involved in all of the sandwiches behind this. But this, she was really happy that it matches the cedar. This is regular old cedar, so I'm probably going to seal this, which means that it's a lot more maintenance than my siding is. But I, I can suffer for a little bit of art. Uh, we also really like that it matches the copper-colored metal roof really well. So all this stuff color-wise I think makes this a very beautiful house. That also is scientifically both interesting and advanced. If you'd like to check out more about this build, we have dozens, maybe over a hundred videos at this point on this build. You will also see this on season two of Home Diagnosis television series. You can find out more about Thermary siding and all the special stuff that goes into it scientifically at thermaryusa.com. If you want to know more about that tiny house over there, there's a whole playlist dedicated to that too that I'm going to link below as well. Please do comment, like, subscribe. Tune in next time.